The title of my talk is Thinking About the Thinkable, Visions and Scenarios. I'm going to talk to you about scenario planning as it applies to the world of urban planning, but also in some other uh, fields. But first, I want to take you back to the uh, inspiration for that title, a book by Herman Kahn called Thinking About the Unthinkable. Herman Kahn was a futurist. He was a game theoretician. He worked for the Rand Corporation, which was a think tank run by the Air Force back in the 1950s and 60s. And he wrote this book, Thinking the Unthinkable, to explain the way in which he used some strange aids to thought, which he called scenarios, to deal with a big question of the time. And that had to do with nuclear war and deterrence. And in his case, thinking the unthinkable meant thinking about actually waging nuclear war and even winning nuclear war, which of course people thought unthinkable. He, he had uh, written a book earlier called On Thermonuclear War. Now I have my copy of the book and it is a very useful introduction to this way of thinking in spite of its somewhat doomsday-like aura. But I think you're gonna have trouble finding it. I did go on the web and, and discovered it was uh, pretty much vanished. So you have an alternative if I've intrigued you about this man. <laughs> Stanley Kubrick made a wonderful movie called Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. It's essentially a dramatic version of Herman Kahn's book, Thinking About the Unthinkable. But let's, uh, that was a 1962 book. Let's fast forward to 1975 and learn about a business application of scenario planning. The Royal Dutch Shell Company was a, a very diversified, decentralized, multinational company headquartered in the Netherlands and in London, managed by a whole group of managing directors, not very top down. And going back to the early 70s, they started running scenarios as a way of thinking about alternative futures. And they adopted this as a model for making business decisions, and indeed by uh, the early 70s, they had run scenarios that considered world oil markets in terms of uh, what could happen if there were uh, an oil embargo by uh, OPEC, the Organ Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, uh, and they actually uh, prepared themselves for that eventuality. They didn't predict it, they didn't know that this was going to happen, but they sat down with a group of uh, folks with diverse perspectives and uh, came up with uh, a number of scenarios, including one that very much anticipated the uh, oil crisis of the 70s. And you may uh, remember uh, Jimmy Carter in the White House wearing a sweater somewhat like this, kind of shivering a little bit as the heat had been turned down, uh, didn't do his career uh, much good. So let's uh, fast forward again and get a little more personal, uh, all the way to uh, 1985, where I found myself uh, appointed as the executive director of the Cape Cod Planning and Economic Development Commission, which is the regional planning agency for uh, Barnesville County, Cape Cod. Uh, and, uh, you know, I looked around and uh, I, I thought, well, it's a planning agency, we probably should have a plan. And I discovered uh, fortuitously that there was a plan. And I actually, uh, I just bought my own copy. I've never had one before. Uh, there's a picture of it. Uh, it was uh, done in uh, 1963, and it looked all the way forward to 1980. I've been enjoying going back and reading it, as I did back in 1985, to see, hmm, it's not really a terribly bad plan. Uh, it has a, a nice uh, uh, land use map that you can uh, uh, fold out that shows where everything ought to be in 1980 kind of seriously underestimated the population of Cape Cod as it turned out to be in 1980. In any case, it was 1985, so this clearly is an out-of-date uh, plan, and I figured, well, that, that means I better do a plan. So the thought was, let's do this in a different way. I don't want to just have an update of a land use map. I don't want a static plan. I really want to bring people together to share their aspirations for the future of this place and do it in a way that cut across the 15 different towns that make up uh, Cape Cod. So uh, we got some uh, data. We, we actually built an economic model, uh, an input-output model, that looked at the uh, uh, transactions or the flows of dollars between businesses on Cape Cod, 
but also looked at outputs like water pollution and traffic, which are the consequences of business activity on Cape Cod, so we could understand the different results that might be had from different scenarios. Uh, we also brought a diverse group of people together and engaged them in thinking about the future. And the goal was to get them to think about a positive future that they might like and then figure out how we might uh, get there uh, and also consider some of the things that might not be desirable. So this is a kind of planning that's come to be known as vision planning uh, uh, as a version of scenario planning. Back then, we weren't quite sure what to call it. Some folks in business thought it, it sounded a lot like strategic planning and certainly was a little bit like uh, what World Dutch Shell had, had been doing. Uh, it permitted us, by bringing diverse people together with different insights from a uh, local banker, a uh, community college instructor, a member of a local planning board, the head of uh, elder services on Cape Cod, uh, it helped us to think about things like some of the conventional wisdom about uh, Cape Cod at the time. Had an aging population. The thought was, well, we're probably going to need a lot more nursing homes and senior citizen centers. And we have a lot of schools. Maybe we should be thinking about converting schools to senior centers. Well, that was the conventional thinking, but we were able to step back and think, well, wait a minute. What if all of the folks who are retiring on Cape Cod, making it a somewhat older place, are going to demand services from younger people who might have families. And guess what? Uh, Cape Cod did nothing but build schools after this point. So it was pretty good to have a different uh, point of view, a different scenario uh, back then. So uh, this project, we called it Prospect Cape Cod. It was a nine-month planning process, very much about citizen engagement. Uh, we uh, didn't have social media back then, but we were able to uh, do scientific surveys to poll the population on 60 key results that this working group had come up with about the future of Cape Cod. And I'd say quite a few of them actually uh, came to be, including the number one uh, result, which was to create a new planning system for Cape Cod. And in 1990, uh, the Cape Cod Commission came into existence as a very different way of making decisions uh, about land use on the Cape. So uh, that's back then, and some things have changed since 1985. For example, climate change has become a major concern for urban planners around the world, and there is uh, something very different about climate change. It has essential unpredictability, essential uncertainty to it. We don't know if uh, sea level, for example, is going to rise uh, two feet or four feet or six feet or catastrophically 20 feet over the next century. And part of the reason we don't know this uh, is we don't actually know what we're going to do in terms of controlling greenhouse gas emissions. So there is uh, increasing uncertainty about our ability to actually reduce the forces of climate change. And that means that the impacts are essentially unpredictable. So this may very well be a job for scenario planning. If I sound like I take this a bit personally, I do. Here is a little bit of a bigger view. You probably all recognize Cape Cod sitting out in the ocean, in the arm. I was actually doing a planning studio with students at Harvard on southeastern Massachusetts and thought, hmm, climate change is important. Let's see how much it's going to affect southeastern Massachusetts. Well, the data that they had included Cape Cod, which was outside the study area. But I happen to notice, if you see, there's a, a wonderful six-mile barrier beach called Sandy Neck uh, sticking out at the Cape Cod Bay. And there's a terrific salt marsh, the great marshes of Barnstable that, that lie behind it. And you will see they are red and blue. And what that means is they are gone. And why do I take this personally? Well, that's my house, that little red dot, if you can see it, on Cape Cod. So I'm right there in the place that no longer is above sea level. So uh, might be a reason to be happy that my colleagues who succeeded me at the Cape Cod Commission have actually gone on to work with federal agencies to apply scenario planning. Now, what scenario planning essentially does is it says, we don't know what sea level is going to be. But if we have a strategy or a plan, let's test it against some plausible conditions. Let's see what, what would happen if sea level rose six feet. Well, if we'd put into the building codes only a three-foot rise in sea level, we'd have a lot of regrets when it actually rose six feet. So it's the kind of thing that makes you think about a resilient strategy that would be successful 
even if the unpredicted event uh, happened, because you were able to consider it as a plausible possibility. And at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, where I work now, we've taken this to build a whole network of planners and software developers to develop open access tools that can help people apply scenario planning methods to a range of planning issues, including climate change. So is there a use for this method outside of the planning world and outside of the world of climate change? Uh, there are a lot of things in life that are unpredictable. Uh, it seems uh, increasingly that uh, political events have become unpredictable. Uh, just this past June, uh, the voters of the United Kingdom surprised themselves by voting to exit the European Union. I think even the strongest proponents of the Brexit were taken completely by surprise when people actually voted to leave. I happened to be meeting with the Royal Town Planning Institute in London right after the vote with people who think about national policy issues in the United Kingdom. None of them had considered a scenario that this vote would actually favor leaving the European Union. Well, as a result, uh, real chaos in uh, the economy, the markets, politics, and you'll see stories every day about the consequences of not having anticipated this. Well, in a couple of weeks, I'm going back to London to meet with uh, spatial planners and policy analysts from around the UK to think about a post-Brexit scenario exercise. And we, yes, we will be running scenarios that consider a range of plausible conditions. My time is up. Thank you very much.